Hello everyone, um, my name is Eun Kyung Lee. Uh, maybe you can get started because the time's up. Um, so, um, so we are uh, in the research group uh, where uh, we studied a lot about the uh, sustainability and the LLM. My name is Eun Kyung Lee and I'm leading one of the research group in IBM Research and in, in a hybrid you know, cloud infrastructure. Hello everyone, I'm very excited to be here. I'm Chen Wang from IBM Research. I'm a staff research scientist working in Kubernetes, a cloud native AI platform, and now in LLM as well, uh, especially in LLM inference. And I'm looking forward to more deeper discussions with all of you uh, offline as well. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Bo Wen. I'm also a research scientist from IBM Research. Uh, I'm from the Digital Health Group. We use a large language model for patient engagement, and today I will show a use case how we do that in, with the help with my colleague. Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Huang Ming Qian. I'm from uh, Red Hat uh, Emerging Technology Group. Uh, so my day-to-day uh, -day work is on the sustainability, how to make energy efficiency available for cloud-native workloads. Yeah, I'm very excited about you know this opportunity to uh, have our presentation to you. So as this uh, this is the tutorial session, you know I want you to have some of the tangible experience, and also we try to share all the GitHub, you know everything that we showed today in the GitHub. I think you should be able to reproduce it at home, as far as you have NVIDIA GPUs at home, right? <laughs> so um, that is our expectation, and um, um, so. So we will be covering you know, a lot of stuff, you know, starting from CNCF, uh, the Cloud Native AI uh, Working Group, and also the Environmental Sustainability Tag. We try to have very um, um, you know, short uh, introduction about that. And also some of the Cloud Native LLM overview, a large language model, and also uh, Cloud uh, Native LLM in action, so how we have to uh, code it and how we have to you know, use the LLM in the cloud infrastructure and the real world user experience. So I really want to have some like end-to-end -end user experience for you. So I think Bo will you know, have one of the really nice um, you know, application, try to just show it to you. And uh, cloud native sustainability in general and also some of the acknowledgement and takeaways. So we truly believe that sustainability is the key, right? So I think you know, this belief is really important because you know, all, the, all the things are happening. Even you know, I heard that you know, today's weather is really abnormal in Paris. I think I heard that it's a 73 Fahrenheit, which is really high temperature today. So I think, you know, over the time, we're seeing that this abnormal temperature happening more and more. So I think global warming is right now happening, and also all the flooding, all the fire, you know, all the things, we really want to stop it or at least mitigate it over time and for our next generation. So there are, uh, this is one side of the humanity side, and the other side could be you know, the company-wise. So this is ESG, uh, environmental responsibility, you know, uh, going to uh, the enterprise. And uh, so you may already know about this like ESG you know, requirement. And the uh, carbon tax, so I think starting from some of the uh, Northern, American, uh, Northern uh, European countries, they try to have like, more carbon taxes. So let's say if you are generating more carbon, and then you have to pay more tax. Um, you know, that kind of thing is in action. So I think one of the example was uh, uh, European, you know, energy efficiency directives. So they are kind of um, asking for, you know, transparent data center energy efficiency. Uh, let's say, I think previously they are blindly, okay, energy efficiency for, you know, data center is this much. Or I think they are, gen uh, they are using lots of energy. But I think they really want to have more transparent, you know, report. Let's say, you know, if you are using this kind of services, how much carbon you are using, right? That requires a lot of measurement methodology, verification methodology that, you know, how we have to verify those numbers, right? Um, and the other thing was the AI Act. So I think AI Act was happening in 2022 or something. And uh, so uh, when you train the model, I think you have to really, you know, transparent about the, you know, how much energy you have to spend. Uh, I think you have to really report it so that, you know, that model quality, I think, you know, that has to be reported to the government. And uh, so I think everyone may know that, you know, overall, you know, uh, interest about the, you know, LLM or the AI. So at the right-hand side chart actually shows that, you know, that is going really, you know, skyrocketing at some point, 
right? So a lot of models comes out, and the GPT-4, even like a lot of um, you know, enterprise, you know, Google, Facebook, even like IBM, we are developing a lot of you know, models, and then energy consumption for training data, cent data centers are you know, skyrocketing. So I think maybe uh, you may heard about this story from you know, uh, some of the keynote, right? So um, you know, using you know, uh, thousands of GPUs at the same time to train uh, GPT-4, GPT-3.5, you know, kind of stuff is happening right now. And this is some of the ballpark number. Uh, this is based on some of the, uh, the report. Um, so they're calculating that you know, based on the average you know, household energy uh, consumption per year, um, I think training GPT-4 model you know, takes up to approximately 10.5K, you know, uh, thousand household per year, so, which is a lot of energy for training one model. Right? So, so by the way, one of the disclaimer was actually that is the estimated number. It's not the you know, actual verified number. So I um, so just want to uh, mention that. So I think what we have to do, um, um, so one of the work group uh, in Cloud Native AI work group, I think we are working on you know, review, promote, you know, the educate the Cloud Native AI ecosystem. So one thing, and then at the same time, we try to reduce energy at the same time. Um, so environmental sustainability you know, tag was um, you know, uh, founded last year, I think maybe two years back. Um, so uh, we are kind of also actively involved in this tag, uh, try to uh, what we can do, right? So I think all the discussion was happening in there. So that is one of the um, you know, tag uh, in um, you know, a cloud native um, you know, tag. Here, so we have you know app de delivery and uh, runtime and security and the sustainability one of the tag. So specifically, what's your mission statement? Right? So, so our goal is to advocate for develop support and uh, help uh, evaluate environmental sustainability. Basically, we are developing the model uh, specifically, and also we are uh, try to um, uh, uh, the identity value, values and you know, possible uh, incentives for uh, the uh, service and providers to reduce uh, the carbon consumption, energy consumption, and the carbon footprint. So if you want to have more uh, um, you know, information, I think you can you know, take a look at this you know, environmental sustainability tag in CNCF, and then you can have a lot of information in there. So this is kind of overview. I think since this is a tutorial session, we have a luxury to uh, have a you know kind of you know what is the steps in the large language model um, you know process. Basically, you have to do a lot of pre-processing. So that involves um, you know clearing data, clearing and also uh, transformation and also a lot of integration and then also reduction. Right. So I think you can have a you know massage lots of data first. And then you know that data goes to training, right? So training, I think you know a lot of you know, multiplication, all this like forward pass, backward pass, and then you have to do a lot of you know calculation in there. And then once the model was built, then you know you have to do inference, and then also you can do the fine tuning, and then you can reuse those model. Let's say you have the base model, and then you can do fine tuning those models, and you can reuse them. So this is kind of entire life cycle. And um, of course, you can add more cycles on, on, on top of this, right? So there's some prompt tuning. There are a lot of other tuning. You can do it on top of this. Uh, but I think this kind of big chunk of the, you know, the cycle of the large language model. Uh, but I think you might wonder um, you know, how much energy they are consuming, right? So I think one of the you know, recent um, you know, Facebook paper was saying that you know, the, I think the left bottom of the graph shows that yellow, ch yellow part is about the pre-processing. This kind of great part is showing the, um, um, you know, the training, and um, the, the black part is uh, the inferencing, inferencing or the, um, you know, deployment phase. Right. So once you use that model, how much energy was consumed? Uh, because uh, the inferencing part is pretty large. You may uh, assume that maybe training takes a lot of, a lot of, you know, energy, but. Uh, d depending on the life cycle of the model, I think inferencing, if you reuse that model over time, then you know, energy consumption for that model is like more for the inference. So that you know, that's, uh, graph shows it. So what is ecosystem, right? So I think a lot of hardware vendors are working on this. You know, um, you know, NVIDIA, Intel, IBM, AMD, I think they are having their own Hardware's and also, you know, a lot of software sca stack was developed on top of it. You know, of course, you know, NVIDIA is kind of almost dominating the, you know, inference or the training a lot. But I think a lot of vendors are working on that. 
And also, um, you know, most of them are, you know, deployed in cloud. So I think they are very, um, um, you know, close to, you know, cloud native. And uh, also, you may have heard, you know, a lot of project related to, you know, those, uh, the cloud native project, you know, uh, in, in this conference as well. And also, what are the ecosystems in, you know, energy carbon quantification in cloud? So I think there's a, a Green Software Foundation. I think there is also this one of, uh, another ecosystem. They're developing some of the tools. Uh, for example, um, uh, depending on the t date of the, uh, day, uh, time of the day, uh, whenever you have a lot of uh, sunlight, uh, for example, then your, your carbon intensity will decrease significantly. Uh, like, you know, the blue curve in the left-hand side, right? So then uh, if you use uh, energy in during that time, actually you can uh, save lots of, you know, carbon footprint because, you know, your energy is, you know, given by the sun, right? Um, I think, you know, there's some SDK. Uh, you can have those information from the, that kind of SDK. There's some like, repository uh, working on that. And also some uh, interesting uh, project about, you know, based on your uh, Python code. Uh, I think based on the line of the code, you know, all the execution path, you can actually estimate the, you know, carbon footprint on that. So there are some, you know, tools are developed, but still we see that there are a lot of uh, opportunities, opportunities are available for, you know, cloud native application. You know, for example, you know, we try to have this Kepler. Uh, Kepler is one of the project, you know, that Huamin will introduce later about the, you know, how you can measure the power based on your, you know, pot level. So I think based on you're running some of the pot and then based on some of the uh, other counter information, we try to estimate the power consumption for uh, uh, running your application. So is it really easy? Uh, of course, no. <laughs> so basically, you know, there are a lot of things has to be, um, you know, equ in, in the equation. So for example, once you only take a look at the energy, then of course, if you don't use the resource, then you sa save energy, but you have to actually compromise some of the performance. But our aim is not actually compromising too much of the performance. So then like uh, what kind of things you have to take a look at it. So basically we have, uh, take a look at a lot of other metrics, for example, throughput, you know, accuracy or the latency or, you know, even like carbon footprint energy, of course, and also the cost, right? So, um, you know, only saving energy uh, is not possible. I, sometimes you have to sacrifice some of the performance, but I think, you know, based on the SLA, even like uh, your service requirement or service level objectives, you can possibly save energy. So I think we are aiming at, you know, given the SLA is given, then like how much energy we can, or the carbon footprint you can save it. Of course, you know, we shouldn't do any, um, um, you know, the greenwashing. So I think uh, greenwashing is the term where uh, you, you uh, really want to show that you're saving, you know, carbon, but actually, in fact, it's not. <laughs> So I think, you know, we have to be really, you know, transparent about this, all the, uh, you know, reporting and stuff. Um, so I think what kind of technology is possible? I try to um, uh, uh, list down some of the things over here. Uh, I think one of the things is accurate quantification is really important. So, so when you're using your resources, how much energy you're using, you know, you have to be really accurate about those numbers. And also, you have to standardize. Let's say, you know, if your workload is running in the cloud, even if you may not, want, may not see the power numbers, right? So maybe you may know the, what kind of hardware you're using, but I think in the cloud level, you hardly see that what kind of hardware you're running. So I think uh, standardization, I think among those like a cloud infrastructure, or what is the you know, hardware they're using, what is the you know, power number, I think that has to be agreed on many different cloud vendors, that, that will be very important. And also inefficiencies in, you know, identified in optimization. So this leads to a lot of techno techniques, you know, that goes later. So I think you have to really identify the bubbles. Uh, bubbles meaning that when you do the, uh, the training or the pipelining. So I think backing up all the uh, pipelines so that you, know, you don't have any bubbles, meaning that, you know, some of the ideal cycle on uh, your resources will be very important. So I think you have to identify those bubbles. And also, you can do, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, techniques, you know, for example, dynamic scaling or resource, uh, dynamic resource, uh, dynamic scaling of the resources, you know, DRA, you may have heard it from the keynote speeches. And also the multiplexing will be very important. And also, you know, power capping of the frequency scaling to save energy. 
So I give some of the example as a preliminary result. So I think I already mentioned about the power capping or the quantization or the uh, enabling MIG, uh, which is you know multi-instance GPUs. Um, you know, right-hand side chart you know shows the um, you know two information at the same time. So I think the bar graph shows the pop, uh, shows the uh, energy consumption. Uh, uh, energy consumption, you know, using have you know different different power cap, and also the line graph, which is you know uh, line graph shows the um, you know performance in latency. So which is you know the lower the better. Right? So I think we try to find a sweet spot. Uh, even like a power capping, meaning you can actually save energy by doing you know lower power capping. Let's say your uh, GPU can uh, spend 400 watt. Uh, but uh, if you power cap it in 250, then you can possibly save energy. But I think you have to really, you know, uh, sacrifice some of the performance. But I think we try to find a sweet spot so that, you know, even if you're doing some of the power capping, still your performance still, you know, good as is. So that is the, you know, this paper we published it, you know, sometime last week. Uh, I'm sorry, last year. Um, and also, you know, multiplexing gives us lots of um, opportunity so that once you multiplex the resources, then, then you can actually save power because you can host many uh, users at the same time. All right, so I will leave this up to Chen right now. Uh, she can do more practical and hands-on experiences. This is kind of overview. So let's uh, also Chen. Okay, now, so uh, now it's the interesting part. <laughs> and uh, let's do some hands-on, um, going through the basics of LLM. And you all know large language models has been attracting a lot of attention. And we will have um, kind of revolutionized all our use cases, business use cases and applications, while this large language model. So behind the scene, every application needs to call an API for the inference. That's why we are discussing about, uh, discussing about the large language model serving here. However, serving large language model is very expensive, is cost-wise expensive, and is also energy-wise expensive. So they run in high-end accelerators, GPUs, like A100. And then if you consider the sequential nature of how large language model is generating tokens, it's all to, like, all their architectures are all too regressive, meaning you input some tokens, and based on all your input, you are generating tokens one by one. And then this sequential nature makes it very, um, ge the generation time, long time. And then if you consider one A100, then you can process, like, less than one request per second. And then in your production use cases, you may have like hundreds of thousands of applications uh, needing to query this large language model. And then you can imagine how many GPUs you want to spend on this. And then how much cost it is. So um, I, I want to, to, to briefly introduce the VLM, which is an open source framework um, for production scale, like uh, large language model serving, because of the, the two techniques uh, they um, actually introduced to optimize the cost to make it faster uh, for production use case. The first one is uh, continuous batching. So it, it first came, comes from the static batching, meaning you can pre-allocate memory uh, to batch more of your request, input request tokens. So uh, you make the, the, all the processing of those requests in parallel to utilize the GPU computing better. And then later they derived from the static batching to dynamic batching, meaning the pre-allocation of your memory is only to the dynamic request that you will have and it batch allocate the memory up to the maximum token you will generate through all the requests you have. And then they also find if you have a very long request, and then all other requests you batch is small, uh, shorter, then you waste a lot of memory in the long request chunk, right, row? And then what's next is they propose the continuous batching, meaning they can concatenate uh, the newer requests to the empty slots of the memory, so you fill a memory up and fully utilize the memory as well as the compute. This is the first technique they introduced. 
And then, so what about those each block of the token they are caching? It's called KV cache. So KV cache is actually the intermediate results for, when, uh, for all the tokens you compute after each layers. And then in order to compute the next token, you need all of those intermediate results cached in your GPU memory. So LLM, LLM inference is not only compute intensive, but also very memory intensive. Uh, that's why we need those uh, high-end accelerators with a large uh, high bandwidth memory. So, um, if you pre-allocate your memory statically uh, in your GPU memory, you need to kind of estimate what's the maximum length of your uh, request will generate and then pre-allocate memory for that. And then in this way, you would end up with a lot of uh, fragmented memories not used because your prediction is never uh, the best, right? So practically, if you will generate uh, 20 tokens, but the maximum possible tokens you will generate might be a uh, thousand twenty-four. So you can think of how much memory segments you are uh, wasting. Uh, so that's why we um, introduce another key technique called page attention kernel, which is basically the have some logical memory space mapping to the physical KV cache blocks, and then to make sure to reduce the fragmentations between requests and also the fragmentations due to the, um, uh, the, 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 the shorter request generation. So you can get into more details from this paper, and I also got the uh, diagram from the paper as well. So let's assume we are building a backend production scale backend um, serving engine. And then um, in our research cluster, one of our need is not only to build the cluster for one model. So all our researchers that want to experience a big set of model, for example, here we want to serve 50 uh, different large language models for like all our researchers. And then we find out like, some models at a certain period, some models are very popular and some models um, um, are less popular over time. Because, for example, last year, everybody wants to try Lamo. This year, everybody wants to try Mistral. And how we deal with the shift of the load uh, at certain period. So um, if we allocate one, at least one GPU per model, and then allocate more GPUs for those popular models, what we will end up with, like, if we have 92 GPUs, and then at a certain point, 74 out of 92 model, uh, GPUs are idling at a certain, uh, certain particular time. And then that's a huge waste of resources and also huge waste of energy. So what, what we can do about it? So the first thing to reduce the energy cost, not the money cost, of course, is to, uh, when those GPUs are idling and models are not popular, we can use NVIDIA, uh, the uh, system management interface, to, the, they provide the GPU clock frequency tuning tool for you. And then um, you, you, you can use the same command line in your GPU server to check how, what, what are the available frequency you can tune the GPU to. And then um, also you can easily just use the NVIDIA SMI to change the frequency of your GPU. So if we try that during idling period, what, what we can get? So when the GPU is idling, if we tune down the GPU clock frequency from like 1,410 megahertz to 540 megahertz, it can reduce the GPU temperature from 39 Celsius to 35 Celsius and then totally reduce the power usage from 55 watts to 35 watts. That's eight idling period. What we, it's basic. So if the GPU is basic, basically in this experiment, we sent like 16 concurrent requests to the LM serving engine that is served on this GPU. And then if we tune down the frequency again, we reduce the temperature from 74 to 61. So you can imagine how much cooling cost you can save. And also reduce the peak power usage from 300 watts to 150 watts. 
And then let's see if we indeed tune down. And then, unluckily, we got a lot of requests coming in. Uh, what will happen to our latencies and throughput on the um, server? So this diagram basically is varying the concurrent number of users. I will say here is we, are, we, we vary the load to the LM server, and we also vary the GPU clock frequencies from like the top frequency they can afford to the lowest one, not to the lowest one, 50, for, uh, 50 40 is kind of like uh, double the lowest uh, uh, frequency you can set. And then the medium per output latency uh, for the, uh, the, the the lowest frequency will be well b below 50 millisecond per sec uh, 50 millisecond per token. So, it, so if you are in this domain, you know like 50 millisecond per token is pretty acceptable when you uh, typing the input and at the same time observing the input. The reading speed, the 50 millisecond per token is completely catching up with your reading speed as well. Uh, so. I will say if you have a low load below uh, 16 concurrent users sending request, then even you tune down the frequency, you, no, you are not sacrificing the uh, service level agreement or the end user experience very much. So it, let's take a look at the 99th percentile uh, latency. So the same thing we can see even we tune down to 540 megahertz. And then if we have a load of 16 concurrent users sending requests, and then our per token latency is still about like 100 millisecond to 120. Uh, so it's a little bit slower, but it's still popping up. So the next one is, what if we not only want to reduce the energy cost, we also want to reduce the money cost, or we even want to use those those GPUs for something else, like for more popular models, um, then what can we do is the second option. We can pack uh, more those small, lightly used models together. We hope we can pack those small, lightly used models into fewer number of GPUs. And then if we look at the size of different models, here is an example in the lower right chart. You can see uh, the memory demand or the number of parameters they have vary a lot. They can spread across eight GPUs and they can even pack into um, one eighth of the GPU. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities here. So then what technology we want to choose? And in um, those are the default options provided by, by NVIDIA GPU. You can do time sharing as long as all your models can fit into the memory. You can do MPS, you can do make, which is static partitioning of your high uh, bandwidth memory, as, as well as the space multiplexing of all your compute. And then here we want to start with trying make uh, because all those memory optimizations that I before on the server, they really make the memory allocation very unpredictable because if you have more requests, they are trying to batch more requests to use more, the memory more efficiently. So if you are sharing uh, the same memory between servers, uh, they may easily lead to um, memory uh, overload of exceptions. Uh, that's why we start with make, which is the static partitioning of the high bandwidth memory. So make basically allows the GPU to uh, securely partition up to seven separate GPU devices, and each of those will have uh, separate and isolated paths to the entire memory system, and it is supposed to be faster, and it's supported um, biometrics containers and the Kubernetes, and the way to enable it, I, I show the simple command here, and then also this diagram shows all the possible make partitions you would have. You would merge two small make partitions to, to 2G, 10GB, which, which is a little bit bigger, and then you can even merge those to 3G, uh, 20GB uh, as needed. So this is the way we configure make partitions on Kubernetes. 
Uh, basically, you need to define your own config map, and using the default GPU operator, you can predefine like whether you want all small slices on one GPU, or you want some balanced configuration with one, uh, one G, five GB, one two G, ten GB, and one three G, twenty GB. And um, all you need is to define those profile and label your nodes with cor corresponding profile you want. So here is a numerical analysis on our previous research cluster example. So what if we m pack all those tail models into fewer number of GPUs, how many GPUs we can save? So we analyzed 42 models among our, uh, all our 50 models. And then they used to need 42 GPUs as they need one GPU per model. And then if they have low load and we use MIG to pack them together, we can totally pack them to 19 GPUs. So in this way, we can save 23 GPUs cost-wise. Oh, we can also use those 22, uh, 23 uh, GPUs to those popular models to reduce their latencies as well. So then the next question is application-wise, do we really need large, very large models for all those large language model applications? And then what if the small models can do the same job? And Paul later will talk more about uh, our experience in using small models. And then here, I just want to highlight some benefits of using small models. So they are first efficient, second, they, are very, they have very low cost, and third, you can easily tune the small model to dom domain-specific models, and then with much cheaper cost. So you don't need a lot of GPUs to tune a small model. And then the last option we want to see is what, what if you still use, want to use a large model but you don't really have the hardware, have the very high-end hardware with a large uh, high bandwidth memory to serve those models. So the option might be the quantized model. And then here, um, we, in this tutorial, we will dem demo the, the, the model with GP, uh, TQ quantization. And basically, it's a layer-wise quantization algorithm trying to minimize the uh, objective function here I show. So the W is the original coefficient of those uh, neural networks, and X can be the input to the neural network. Then the quantization is basically coming up with the W hat which you can minimize the difference between the two. In this way, you don't lose the accuracy as well as you make the model smaller, and the W hat can be just, uh, just uh, like four-bit integer, while the W is a 16-flow uh, si point uh, data. And then the, the, t the bottom left figure is, uh, is showing uh, the original GPTQ paper, how accurate the quantized model compared to the uh, original model. So for those different OPT family and Bloom family, you can see the, um, the, the, the blue dots line is the original floating point models. And then the four bit G GPTQ model is the model after quantization. And then, then from the benchmark, their accuracy results are really similar. And what's interesting to us is we can now use even smaller make petitions, for example, the 2G, 20, uh, 10 GB make slice, or oh, uh, oh, oh, 3G, 20 GB make slice to fit those quantized model instead of using the whole GPU. So when we are using the smaller models and quantized models system-wise, how much performance we are sacrificing here? Um, so let's make an assumption if the app doesn't really need uh, to generate a lot of requests at the same time. Let's see if the concurrent number of users or queries sending requests is less than A. Then switching to the quantized model as we uh, stated before, you can just use one half a one eighth of the GPU to serve the model. And if the concurrent concurrency for the load is below A, 
And then you can see the uh, 15 millisecond uh, second per token SLA line. And then you can see all those latencies are still within our SLA. It's still acceptable. Of course, if you have a lot of requests coming in, you may want to switch to the A100 uh, to serve, the, uh, serve those models as well. I want to highlight, so this chart, the contest model, uh, Latency goes up very quickly it's because we squeeze them into smaller make partitions. And if you use the large, um, the same A100 accelerator, it will uh, be similar to the original model as well. So quantization is, quantization and smaller models can really uh, serve your goal if you don't have the large device and uh, you don't have enough resources. So in, next, we will show a quick demo on how to deploy our application. This is our whole setup. We have one small quantized model, which is Llama 2, 7B, GPTQ model, uh, served on a 2G, 10GB um, mix slice. And one uh, larger quantized model, Llama 2, 13B, uh, GPTQ model served on 3G, 20GB mix slice. And then original uh, 7B, Llama 7D model uh, served on the whole A100. And before the servers, uh, we develop uh, our VM router that will automatically route the request to the corresponding model we have. And be Behind the VM, VM router, we will have load generator and our application uh, Bob will introduce later. Uh, in the observability stack, uh, all those servers are exporting those metrics to Prometheus. And we use Grafana to visualize our results. And we use um, NVIDIA uh, DCGM exporter to export those metrics uh, for visualization uh, purposes as well. And last, the, uh, Huami will introduce our uh, enhancement in Kepler to export all those energy consumptions. So for all those open source projects, you can scan the barcode to get the tutorial as well. So uh, now I will have a quick, quick demo on showing the, uh, the demo video. Sorry, it really takes some time to load the video. It seems we have a lot of people here, so we don't have good internet. <laughs> Time. Do you have any questions? I think you know this is should be interactive a little more. Sure. <laughs> Could we mirror the, the huh? screen? Could we mirror the screen instead? Mirror screen? Yes. Okay, you can. You have you have my video, right? Okay.
you see? No, it's not showing up. Are you making this on that screen? Oh, I'll move to the screen. Sorry for the trouble. Okay. Just a little bit. show. Are you working? Okay. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so basically, they, uh, if you scan the barcode in the previous slides, you will go to this tutorial and we will go through the steps of uh, deploying those servers and um, applications. There are two ways. One way is we provide a, a whole deployment YAML to deploy everything including the router, the, um, all the service monitor necessary to the uh, exporting the permissions metric. The other way is you use the ham chart we provide. And then here I will show a uh, quick step on how we uh, deploy the whole setup, system setup. So you can configure the models you have, all the necessary parameters, and even the um, model ID, and then uh, we also um, open source the VM router as well in both GitHub and Quay. And the HIME really helps you do the one, um, one step setup. And now you can see there are three VM server running different models. And then we also have our uh, application Twilight chatbot deploy, and then uh, as well as the VM router. So next, I think I'm, I'm going to dem demonstrate how to quickly run the load generator uh, for all the experimental results I've shown and shared in our slides today. And this is an example dashboard for the um, VLM server we have. And it will show you uh, performance metrics such as the throughput, the time to first token latencies, and the per output token latency. And this, this is a DCGM dashboard where you will see all your GPU uh, frequencies, temperatures, uh, energy consumptions. So make sure you set up your uh, hugging phase secret uh, before all those steps. And also make sure you uh, set up the resource claims and um, resource volume for your uh, vocaching of your models. So here we are, they uh, pre-configure our hugging phase secret to just fetch the model. And this Kepler demo is, um, uh, tutorial is actually in the sustainable computing IO org in GitHub. Um, And here, we are just to configure the persistent volume and persistent volume claims to catch the results of the benchmarking uh, of the load generator. And to, to start running the load generator, it's very simple. You configure .env file to configure the maximum config concurrency, just like the results I showed before in the chart, and then uh, some other parameters like the, the, the models you want to test, and how many um, prompts you want to generate for this experiment. And this config map is just wrapping up the .env file you configure. And once the config map is ready, you can go ahead and create the load testing job. 
the load testing job will automatically grab those parameters and generate request. So I think uh, that's all of the demo. And next, uh, I think uh, Bo from IBM Research will introduce our application and how he developed the application connecting to those uh, large language model uh, inference servers. No, no, no. No, no, I want that. Okay, so uh, I will first uh, give some uh, background context of uh, this use case. It's about dementia. Dementia is one of the biggest impact, biggest uh, health crisis impacting our society and economy nowadays. Uh, according to the World Health uh, Organization, there are 15 million people have dementia worldwide, and it will be tripled by 2050, reaching 150 million globally. Um, the economic cost is around one trillion around 2018. And, it can, and we can try to understand that from our more personal connecting way, like all of us are middle-aged young people, right? And some of you probably have kids, and we all have our parents. So uh, my grandparents actually one of them have dementia towards the elder days. And uh, throughout my grow up, we can see like, well, now my parents are still healthy, so I'm lucky. But if one day their health start to decline, I will have to take care of my kids while I take care of my parents. So we become like a candle burning on both ends. So this is why uh, dementia is one of the things that not just from a humanity point of view that we should love and take care of our family, but from the society point of view, if this is if health crisis is not uh, being addressed, it becomes an unsustainable situation for the whole society because the productivity is going to go down. All of us have to take care of uh, all our loved ones and no one is available to do the jobs. And prevention is the key to become sustainable in this situation. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, research showing that uh, you just need to use your brain more. And that's the key to prevent this, uh, to get uh, dementia in the elder age. So reading is one of the things that can make your brain more active as well as other cognitive active tasks like using your computer rather than just watching TV. You just need to use your brain more. Uh, that's the key message to take away. And in order to do that, one of the research projects that uh, IBM, that my group, Digital Health, is working with uh, Harvard Medical School is a pilot study to um, to get the elderly people in the assistant living facility to engage in reading. And hopefully that will help them to maintain their cognitive uh, activity. Um, but for all those people, you can imagine, uh, they are actually about 65 years old or even elder. Like uh, sometimes uh, walking around for them is difficult. So how do you engage them to like keep reading every day that become itself become a challenge. So that's where a large language model become uh, helpful here. Uh, we developed this uh, chatbot. Uh, the goal of the chatbot is not to test whether the reader understands the book, but is to make the reading a more enjoyable experience, is to talk about the chapter they just read, and then maybe also talk about some other stories, uh, fun, memory, moments with their life so that to make them feel like reading is not 
just uh, being alone, but it's having something more interactive. Um, okay, so let me show you. The next thing is the demo. Let's see if it works. It's working, okay. So uh, I'm showing you side by side two screens. One on the left hand side right now is powered by GPT-4 and the one on the right hand side is powered by Lamina 13B uh, quantized model, uh, quantized version. And then we also have the Lamina 17B uh, the non-quantized version and quantized version we will show in the next. So we will start chatting with the bot. So of course, a different model will respond a little bit differently, but uh, the main idea is the same, and we'll try to respond in a similar way to see how the model responds. And the idea here is to show you like what Chen mentioned before. The bigger model sometimes may not be the best choice for the task, and you will see why very soon. So we are talking about uh, Alice in the Wonderland, the first chapter. Uh, the assumption is the reader already read the chapter, and now we are having a conversation with them about the book. And try to make them more engaged and feel it's more fun to read more. And you can see the GPT-4 uh, response is actually more sophisticated, just having more words. I can speed it up a little bit. Okay. okay. So the bigger model tends to respond with a more sophisticated answer, and now we are going to show you the smaller model. And you can see the smaller model tends to give a very short sentence response. And in this use case, actually, that's preferable, because uh, for the elderly at that point, um, our medical team tell us keep their reading level around five to like four to five grade graders, because uh, at that point, because they already start to experience cognitive decline, uh, if you give them a long question, they actually cannot pay attention to it. They will forget, and then they will feel fatigued, and it will make them a bad experience with the chatting, um, with the chatbot. So the goal is uh, you want to really have a short and sweet, like you're talking to kids, so actually the smaller model here, the behavior is more preferable in this use case than the larger model. And that came to bad, that's why we chose this for this uh, demo purpose, is to show you sometimes bigger model may not be, it use more energy, but it might not be what we are looking for from user experience point of view. Okay, so that's the end of the demo. And let's move on to next. I will talk about how we build this demo. Um, so this is the this is the architecture of the application. Uh, in the bottom, as a uh, Chen showed before, we use a VLM as a engine to host our Lamina models, and then uh, GPT-4, of course, is uh, through their API, cloud API, and then in the middle. We use a LangChain as the prompt engineering framework to, uh, to connect with the LM, as well as a, a, a rack. In this case, is the chapter of the book that the LM is tracking. And then uh, there's also other necessary uh, memory, uh, 
man man memory management um, is uh, the user database. So we give the profile of the user to the LM so to customize the chatting to become more personalized. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we use the chainlet as the chat engine to host the front end that uh, connects to a web UI that you saw just now. But in our repo, you will see we also have a voice uh, interface, which is uh, through Twilio integration. So the elderly can actually just uh, call in and then talk to the chapel over the phone or through text messages. Um, it's just uh, providing more ways for the user to, to have an interaction with the system. Um, and here, this is uh, how, so Chainlet and uh, Langchain, they are, so VLM is a very popular framework, so Langchain already provide a very nice package to APM. Uh, the way to call it is just uh, calling one function, and then you can put in the URL from the server where you are serving the model, and then the model you want to serve, and then uh, other parameters that you want to use to control the LLM behavior. And here is uh, some simple example to show you how to do the prompt engineering. There are already trap templates. Uh, I will show you the uh, source code later. Uh, oh, sorry, one thing I want to mention. So uh, for different models, uh, the template is a little bit, th this is a caveat between different models. Uh, for example, for uh, Lamina Chat and, uh, and uh, ChatGPT, they are trained to be a chat, they are fine tuned with a chat behavior. So when you prompt with, when you generate a prompt mod template model, uh, they expect to have a chat, which means uh, it's a round by round uh, interaction with the model. Um, but with other models, uh, like mixture, those are uh, fine tuning for instruction. So uh, if you want to chat with them, you have to use some uh, special uh, um, prompt engineering technique. You need to tell them, here is a history of the chat, and I want you to respond what is the next sentence you want to respond. So you are trying to mimic the chat behavior with them. But essentially what the model is doing is still doing uh, completion, meaning it's just uh, extending what's the, what's the uh, prompt, uh, what's the input prompt that you gave it, and then you try to extend it. Um, and Chainlet, Chainlet is actually a startup from here, from Paris. Um, so we thankful to the funders here, they are doing a great job. Chainlet really makes uh, building a chatbot very easy. Uh, it's built on top of a fast API. So if you're familiar with fast API, you see the decorator, that's idea, main uh, signature idea from there. And then uh, you, most of the time, you only need to define two functions. One is to initialize your chatbot with this uh, function. And then this is uh, how do you want to handle the wrong by wrong interaction with your chatbot. And after this function, and then you just run the server, and then uh, all the UI and everything else is taken care of for you. So the, chat, the demo you saw just now uh, that we showed before actually only took half an hour to build this part. And uh, here, so this is the URL to the repo if you want to check out the source code. And uh, actually, we have a variety of range of uh, contributors to us. Some of them is only from high school. They are concerned with their grandparents, so they are contributing their ideas to, the, to this project. Of course, also uh, researchers from Harvard Medical School. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will give it to Amin. Thank you. Um, 
All right, so let's come to the sustainability, uh, what we do here for uh, measuring the power consumptions used by large language models. So the project Kepler, uh, you may have already seen the projects being mentioned uh, multiple times in the cube count here before. So they are wonderful maintainers also here in the conference. Um, there are some more talks available uh, later today and tomorrow. Uh, so welcome to the uh, maintainers of uh, Kepler. So the projects uh, is mostly about how can we use um, certain methodologies to give you the idea of how much energy used by your containers, your processes, or virtual machines. So these are very interesting information you can use to fine tune your application and also fine tune your deployments models so that you can achieve your sustainability goals. So Project Kepler uh, is currently a CNCF in Sandbox. Uh, we are very glad to grow the community strong and um, uh, here is a quick introduction of the framework. So uh, if you look at the different columns on the diagrams, uh, we partic uh, particularly on the left side, this is the tricks that we collect information from the operating system uh, using eBPF. Uh, as you know, that eBPF has uh, the capabilities of being small, uh, being versatile. It's able to collect different levels of information as operating system level and hardware level. Uh, specifically, uh, in Kepler, we build uh, multiple entry points uh, called probes, and each of the probe functions will intercept certain OS level if, uh, contact switches and uh, software IQs and uh, uh, memory page, dirty memory pages. So that we can count, uh, collect a whole picture of how the processes and containers uh, works inside of the operating system. Using that information, we move up to the, actually we move right to the middle column. This is the place that we um, using the eBPF collected information to correlate with the user space information to paint a bigger picture of what the, the process's ownership. So the process could be inside of a container or could be uh, inside of the virtual machine. Uh, so this is the uh, mapping that we create in this area. And then, once we get all these information, we associate the energy consumption with activities about these uh, processes and containers using certain ratio method. So currently, in biometric environments, we're using the CPU instructions uh, to attribute energy. So let's just say um, the whole server, uh, hypothetically using simple numbers, the whole server uses 100 CPU, si uh, CPU instructions and process A using the 30 instructions at this time, and process B use 70 instructions uh, at this time. So as a ratio, the process A will get 30% of the energy consumed in the collection window, and in process B gets 70%. And thus, the power information we get from different in platforms uh, depends on the configurations and hardware architectures. On x86, we get the power information from the REPL, the runtime average power level. On certain ARM platforms, uh, we're using the hardware sensors uh, to get the CPU level of um, energy consumption. Um, on virtual machines, where you do not have access to the hardware counters to get energy consumption, we're using machine learning models uh, to estimate how much energy during this time duration based on the CPU activities. Uh, so that is one of the areas we actively modeling on different hardware architectures. Aside from CPU, we are also able to manage the GPU and server level energy consumptions using different libraries. At the server level, using the REPL and the ACPI to get the platform level energy consumption. And on the GPU level, which is coming up next, is various platform dependence. We use in, uh, uh, we currently support NVIDIA GPU using the NVIDIA management uh, library. Uh, there are two libraries over there. One is uh, NVML, the other one is uh, this, uh, data center GPU management, which will come up next. So as we are just going through the um, discussions before, so the level of configuration in GPU actually varies based on the deployment models. If you are deployment one model, one GPU, you can get the power consumption from the GPU and you can attribute the total energy consumption to that model completely. So that is a simple case. We can use in, um, you know, NVIDIA um, uh, NVML library to get all this information. But if you are having this um, MIG multi-instance GPU, 
that you are sliced up or GPU it into multiple slices, and each of the slices we are just serving one model, then things can be very tricky because uh, NVIDIA does not give you per slice level energy consumption, which have to uh, come to us to do a certain level of uh, uh, estimation and modeling to come up with energy consumption, uh, which is going. Uh, we are using multiple level of information here. So if you are, this is a snapshot snapsh snapsh of the NVML, uh, NVIDIA SMI output. So you see here we have multiple outputs from here. On the high, uh, uh, highlighting in red, uh, this is the uh, positions, uh, this the, uh, the, the identifiers of different mix. So we have three mix in this picture. Uh, so they have a GPU ID, GPU instance ID, uh, in short is a GI ID, and a compute instance ID, in short is a CI ID, and a MIG, uh, a MIG number. So this is the information uh, in programming, programmatical level. We have to go and use in the DCGM uh, library to get it. Uh, so highlighted in blue, this is the multiprocessor count. So uh, we are using A140 gig uh, NVIDIA GPU. So the multiprocessors, if you are slice up the GPU, as we said uh, before, there's a three slices. Uh, I think it's a 3G20 and a 3G10 and a 2G10, something like that. So the biggest one uh, has uh, 42 multiprocessors. Uh, coming up next is 28 and 14. So this is information we can get from a media uh, library, NVMR. So the very last one is the uh, processes that are using the GPU. So as we see here, in highlighting in green, so we see the process ID, uh, the PID, and we also see the um, uh, GPU ID on the left, and the GPU instance ID, uh, which is true in this case. So and then we can make a mapping between the GPU and the GPU instance ID with the process ID to correlate which, which processes or containers are using the GPU slice. And then with that information, we can also go into the energy estimates by using the multiprocessor counts with respect to the whole GPU in order to get the uh, estimates of how much energy used by that slice which are consumed by certain processes or containers. So that's the basic idea. In short write-up, uh, so we need to get a number of information from the uh, GPU as well as from the operating system to match the uh, which processes uh, using different information we get from uh, containers, uh, containerization runtime, and uh, information from the GPU libraries to get the mappings between the GPU slice and GPU uh, physical GPU ID. With the same uh, create, uh, we create certain models to estimate how much energy consumed by the whole GPU can be attributed to that CPU slice. So that is something we still we are, are working on a different formulas. So one of the formulas totally based on the CPU count, uh, on the computation units counts. So we using the if you are using the NVIDIA GPU uh, DCGM, you know there's an event called a uh, tensor utilization. So the number of uh, percentage of active tensors currently using by the GPU slice. So that's the um, indicator we are using for attribution. So if you are having a process that's using a certain MIG, and as a certain time of the sampling, we find out the um, the tensor utilization. Let's see what's the number is here. Temp uh, tensor utilization is uh, points to uh, twenty percent, and the uh, the GPU ratio is uh, fifty percent, meaning the biggest uh, slice, as we showed in the last slide, uh, the thirty twenty uh, make. And uh, we can do a simple math. If you are for 20, uh, 250 watts of power consumption, we can divide that by ratio, CPU, uh, the processor ratio, 0.5, 50%. And then within these 50%, only 20 of them are actively using. So we divide times another 20, we get the total CPU consumption on that slice. And that's uh, a number of uh, uh, energy can be attributed to the slice and eventually go into the containers. Um, and then we get all this information in the Kepler as well as uh, in VLLM, and we can use some Prometheus to plot the whole diagrams uh, on the dashboard. So we are using, uh, so in Kepler, you find a number of uh, uh, metrics available. One of which is interesting to you is the Kepler container metrics. And inside of the container metrics, we have a GPU total joules. 
So this is an aggregation of how many energy, how much energy has to be consumed by the uh, by the part that's used specifically on GPU. So as you see here, before the workload gets started, uh, the GPU consumption is almost zero. Um, there's some idle power. So once the workload gets kicked off, uh, we are using a single um, query on the our language models backend, VLM backend. We see the energy consumption just spike up, and uh, eventually, using the amount of energy, it's going to be stabilizes. So that's one of the ways you can query how much energy used by a part. Um, so the next thing I think most people are interested in is uh, how much energy you, you need to generate a single uh, token. So this is a, this is very interesting because at the end of the day, is uh, you know for people who are doing the back, uh, management, managing these uh, clusters and data centers, they care a lot about the energy consumption in the data center. Uh, as you know, um, if you are running the GPU, once it's powered on, even on A100 or H100, the power consumption is could be one anywhere between 500 to seven, uh, 1,000 watts, depending on the number of GPUs you have. And the latest announced by NVIDIA, the uh, B100 and B, uh, upcoming B200, the energy consumption is even higher. So the data centers may not be able to, may not be configured in that way. So if you are providing the token, uh, you know, token per watt level of management, it will be very intuitive for people to manage the you know, models as well as the infrastructures to match up with the workloads. So this is the uh, metrics we believe will provide you such directions. So we get the token throughputs from VLVM. So again, this is just on the throughputs. It has nothing to do with the latency, uh, which is more on the usability side of the story. So performance-wise, uh, uh, we get the uh, throughputs, and energy-wise, we get the uh, capital container mass, a uh, container GPU energy in terms of what in the wasp units because we take the rate over the uh, gauge. So that's will give you the wasp level information. And if you are, because GPU is not the only resource that's being used by the container, we also have CPUs together. So you also want to have the whole pictures of how much energy indeed used by the containers on per token level if, uh, service. Uh, so we also aggregate all the resources used by the container in the another metric called a GPU, uh, capital container juice total, which will include both GPU, CPU, and DRAM. Uh, in more visible ways, we can visualize the whole thing in a Grafana dashboard. Uh, so in this, uh, again, this is just for information. It does not mean which models is more efficient than the other or which models is more high-performing high than the other. Because I used uh, same concurrency, so I used uh, 10 uh, queries for all the backends. You know, certain backends, because of the computation and the memory constraints, I may not su uh, support that kind of batch configuration. Uh, so this is just, let's just say you have hypothetical use case of serving 10 queries per second, and you are serving from different workloads, different large language models from different hardware configurations. So what would be the uh, visually uh, representative uh, energy per second uh, kind of uh, information you can get. So on the top panel, this is uh, uh, from the uh, VLM, so the uh, throughputs based on different models. On the top one, the yellow, you are seeing this is uh, from the uh, Lama 27B unquantized, unquantized. So this is from the using the whole GPU. Uh, this throughputs could go as high as 600, um, per, uh, 600 tokens per second. And uh, the second one, let me, I had to read it from here. Okay, the second one is a uh, 13B, uh, Lama 2, 7, uh, 7, 13B uh, quantized model. Uh, you get a 200 uh, tokens per second. Uh, the reason that the bigger models in this case is doing better than smaller models uh, in terms of throughput is that, in my opinion, is that uh, because the resources uh, CPU resources give to the language models a difference. The 7B unquantized, uh, unquantized is using the whole GPU. The 13B gets twice as much uh, GPU resources as the 7B quantized version. So the throughput also be higher than the 7B. Even 7B is a smaller model, but the because of the resource we are giving to it is smaller. Uh, it's actually half of the 13B uh, quantized, so you get an even lower uh, throughput. 
on the uh, middle panel, you see is a, that's a breakdown of energy spending on CPU and GPU. Uh, the takeaway from the diagram is that the GPU even is a two, only two A100, using almost 10 times more energy than CPU, uh, which is one of the reasons uh, GPU optimization make a big bang of the buck out of the whole picture. At the very bottom is the panel. At the very bottom panel, you see the um, uh, token per watt uh, comparison. Again, I'm, I'm not saying which model is better than the other in terms of uh, sustainability. Just for reference, if you are configured a model to serve in certain workloads or uh, time queries per second, which other ones uh, may be more efficient than the other ones? So the Llama 7, 7B uh, model uh, using the whole GPU, you can get uh, three. Uh, you can get three tokens per watt, right? So, which is actually high performing in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, you get more um, bucks per money uh, per dollar, more watts per per dollar uh, versus the other. The 13B quantized version, uh, using which using half of the GPU, can give you um, you know one token per second. Uh, so what? Sorry, one talk to one token per watt. Again, this is always uh, has no um, relationship with the uh, latency, just the purely based on the token perspective. The smallest model, in this case, 7B quantized, only generates almost half token per watt. Um, so this just gives you some uh, visual representation and some of the touch points. If you are managing a large language, language uh, model serving inference infrastructure with certain, infra in certain configurations, what are the potential uh, metrics you can consider to save energy while still maintaining your service level agreements? Right. So um, this is the, using 10 concurrent queries, and we also have a recorded demo using just one Query, uh, one stream of queries, and the picture actually looks a little bit different. The energy per watt numbers, uh, it's not as uh, significant. The data may not be as significant as the the one I just show. I will just leave this uh, YouTube video for you to for you to um, you know watch uh, offline after this talk. I just skip this one. We have a we have a te we have a technical issue. The browser actually crashed. Coming back very soon. Skip it. We we'll skip. It. Uh, we can skip it. It's a YouTube video, so we can actually let you watch offline. Sorry for the delay. Are you gonna switch it? All right, let's skip this. Okay, we're going to skip this one. Um, yeah, let's uh, come together. So this is acknowledgement to all the people who actually make this uh, work possible. Uh, we appreciate all the IBM team, uh, IBM research team uh, we collaborate closely with, and some of them working with Kepler, some of them working on the uh, AI. This is a, a very substantial lineup of uh, talents 
are sitting behind the scene to make this happen. And also we appreciate the uh, people who are volunteering for the um, application developers from Tree Lights uh, chat. Uh, we have uh, wonderful experiences working with end user experiences uh, to identify the use cases of uh, small models, large models, and different uh, connecting uh, techniques uh, to make the end user experience uh, better. Um, for takeaway, uh, we do have a uh, lot of activities going on in this KubeCon. Now we have the sustain uh, cloud native AI working group. Uh, we have um, the white paper just published recently, so you can see there's a lot of information you can find over there. Uh, the configuration, the deployments, and uh, even the background of AI, and also sustainability is how cloud native AI can help us work together. Uh, it's all the information you can find over there. And we, uh, Cloud Native AI uh, work groups also have these bi weekly meetings. Um, uh, welcome to join the meeting. Uh, we also have the bi weekly meetings on so environmental sustainability tech. Uh, I think the Neil, the tech lead, is also here in the meeting, um, in the conference. So he has a talk on uh, sustainability sometime tomorrow. So welcome to uh, Neil's talk. Um, the significance of uh, large language models as a utility for day to day life and also as the challenge in our environmental uh, sustainability are both visible and doing something to mitigate the risk and while improving the quality of life is quite beneficial to all of us. And I believe technically that is also very encouraging to take. So I welcome uh, everybody will you know, spend time looking at this, make technologies available and make the use case more appropriate for your environmental considerations. So we do have a uh, current support for NVIDIA GPUs, uh, which we have already uh, identified certain use cases, how you can measure the CPU power consumption, how you can correlate with your large language model's performance to provide the you know, interesting use cases uh, to choose the best models uh, while uh, preserving the energy consumption. We're also exploring ways to support other type of GPUs and accelerators and uh, vendors who are interested in working with Kepler, working with uh, I know, you know, different language uh, serving infrastructures, uh, this could be a very exciting playground for everybody. Uh, very lastly, um, so thank you all for coming to the session, and if you have questions, uh, this is just time. Okay, yeah, just a question is about how to map the, the PID to the container ID. Um, so there's a different ways. I believe uh, NVIDIA uh, DCGM exporter is one way and Kepler uses a different way. So the, the way Kepler uses is uh, using a C group file system, uh, namespace to ID conversion. So if you are query, you get the uh, container ID and also the process ID, and then you query the C, C group file system with the, PI, uh, with the container ID, then you can get the, uh, the container info uh, container ID, the container name actually. So eventually you query with the Kubernetes API, you can correlate the C group ID with the container ID. Sorry, that's a three entity. C group ID, which is 64 bits, a uh, num uh, numerical number. Container ID is a hash number. And then we go in from there, you can go into mapping which are the processes using that container. Oh, okay, so the very missing piece is the eBPF. So when eBPF go into the contact switch, uh, level of a probe, you get the C group ID, you get the PID. So that's the mapping with the C group ID to your PID. And then we pop up to the uh, user space level with the C group ID, and then we get the hash ID, the C container ID. And then from the container ID at the C group level, you query the Kubernetes API, and you get the you know, container pod name. So there's a true level of resolution, and that's how we get it. Thank you. Right. So everybody gets everything. That is great. Uh, if you have no more questions, maybe you can just uh, you know miss offline and GitHub questions. That's all welcome. <laughs>